My guest today is uh, Dr. Yusuf Hamid, armed with a PhD from chemistry from Cambridge. As a teenager, he joined a small pharmaceutical firm which was founded by his father. Today, 60 years later, that firm, Sipla, is, has a turnover that's in crores, many, many crores, and it's an international player when it comes to making HIV and AIDS drugs. So one of NDTV's greatest, 25 greatest living Indians, Dr. Yusuf Hamid, thank you so much for speaking to us. You're acclaimed internationally, basically because you have substantially reduced the price of HIV AIDS drugs, and so you have substantially affected, improved the lives of millions of people. Dr. Hamid, thank you for speaking to us. You know, some people have called you a pirate, some people call you a messiah. That depends on which side of the patent row you're sitting on, correct? What do you think is the fair value or the reward one should get for creating a new medicine? I think uh, the story should start from 1939. Okay. Uh, my story starts from 1939. When Mahatma Gandhi visited Sipla, my company, and told my father that Britain has offered India independence if India would assist Britain in the, in the war. war effort. So my father said, why have you come to me? He said, because medicines have stopped coming from Europe to India. So what happened at that time, he instilled in us a sense of self-reliance and self-sufficiency. And that has held us in good stead even today. And I'm a great believer that India should follow a course of self-sufficiency and self-reliance and that India's destiny depends on that. Future depends on that. And this goes back a long time that even today, self-reliance and self-sufficiency. So when I came back after my studies, and I'm a great believer in education, uh, and came and joined CIPLA in 1960, I found that the patent regime at that time blocked me from doing anything that I wanted. And for 12 years, we fought with the Indian government to change the archaic patent laws of India, which were the British laws of 1911. Correct. And Indira Gandhi in 1972 changed the laws. In effect, they, she legalized that India could produce any drug they wanted. There were no product patents. The only the process could be patented for a period of seven years. And it gave us the legal freedom to introduce into India any new drug we wanted and made us self-sufficient. So what you see today in India in the health care business where we are today self-sufficient was definitely because of the 1972 Patent Act gave us the freedom that today India is regarded as the pharmacy capital of the world. Correct. So, yeah. so I'll go back to the question about the value of creating a new product. But So then where do you see the relevance of a company like Sipla in this new world today where patents can't be broken, where the TRIPS agreement comes into play by 2015 or 2013? It is already in place. All right. It's in place 2013. It is already in place. 1995. Okay. It got into place. So I'm coming to that. So it, it allowed us the legal freedom and all the HIV AIDS drugs that CIPLA manufactured in the 90s and in the early 2000 were all legal. So the question of piracy doesn't come in. Everything that we do is legal. We do not break any laws. That's in Africa as well. What I'm trying to picture and I'll give you the Indian example. Do you know what is the disease pattern in India? No. Let me tell you. 110 million mentally retarded or mental care patients. 80 million cardiac. 60 million asthmatics. 50 million hepatitis cases. Diabetes. One in three Indians has got latent TB. 60 million diabetics. Health care in India is a permanent crisis. And we have never ever questioned patents. Please okay. listen to me very carefully. I'm a scientist. I honor science. And I do believe that science is important. But what we are against is monopoly. India, with this disease pattern I've just shown, 
with a population that is going to be 1.65 billion by 2050, we simply cannot afford a monopoly in health care. So and what happens now, now that India is signatory to the TRIPS agreement? What India happens to Indian pharmaceutical companies? Yeah. So within the gambit of what is called trade-related intellectual property, there are flexibilities. And it is up to India to use its flexibilities that are legally allowed. And one of the major flexibilities is the question of compulsory licensing. Or now I've coined the word arbitrary licensing. I don't compulsory is a bit harsh. So what we should do is to frame our own licensing policy whereby the innovator of a new drug gets a suitable royalty, but we are not denied and that there should be no monopoly. Only monopoly leads to high prices. Correct. If there's free and People always say, but how much money is spent on research and development? Do you know that internationally, 84% of all the money spent in R&D, in healthcare, mm -hmm. is public funded, Correct. government funded? Correct. Universities. So, so I, I do believe that if it is public funded, the public have a right to the rewards of that research. And this is the one thing, and India can for India to survive in the future, you cannot afford monopoly in health care. Well, that answers my first question then. If yes, it's publicly certainly. funded, everybody has a right. Over everybody it. has a right. Um, all right, Dr. Hamid. Um, you know, you've really made your name and your legacy is really that you've helped fight the serious problem of AIDS and HIV in countries like Africa. How do you feel about the fact that you haven't really been able to do it to that extent in India? For example, you've offered medicines to the Indian government, which they haven't picked up because of our own issues with where we see the AIDS epidemic in India. Let's, let's talk first internationally. Okay. What happened in the HIV AIDS front is very simple. It is a question of what was being sold in Africa for twelve thousand dollars per patient per year we offered at three hundred a dollar a day and that somehow changed the face of treatment of HIV AIDS it transformed the entire it transformed story. and it also showed the greed of the large multinational companies even today the largest selling AIDS drug in the world in America a tripler is sold for twenty four thousand dollars per patient per year and we are giving it to Africa at below $100 right. per patient per year. So there's a big disparity. And it again proves my point, which people in India and particularly the government are not understanding, the power of monopoly. If you have a monopoly, you can price whatever you want. So how do we break monopoly in healthcare? That should be the main concern of our government and health care and Ministry of Health. This is our belief that monopoly. Now why it doesn't affect monopoly so much in England? Would you like to know why? Yes. Because if you're a monopolist and your customer is also monopoly or a monopolist, mm -hmm. he dictates terms. In, in, in England with the health system, NHS system, government buys. Government buys. In Australia, government buys. In Germany, government buys. Not in India. So you have to have a different framework. So in India, the government does buy. Like we have a policy, NACO, etc. But when the government doesn't give as much of a priority to the problem of AIDS, something you've built your entire legacy on, what does that make you feel? I think on the AIDS, let's keep the AIDS issue aside for the time being. I do believe that if the government wants to introduce cheaper medicines, better medicines, then what they should really do is draw up an essential drug list. Uh, by essential drug list, I mean not drugs that are 20 years old and 30 years old, which 20 people are making in India, because well, that's competition. Make out an essential drug list of key drugs that only a few companies are making. Produce them in your public funded 
and public laboratories. You've got IDPL, you've got Hindustan Antibiotics, you've been called Chemicals, Smiths. You've got one dozen public sector pharmaceutical companies. And I assure you, and I'm saying this publicly, that companies like CIPLA are prepared to give technology to the Indian government factories totally free. You produce your essential drugs. You price them according to what you want. And we, the rest of the country will have to follow suit. So do that for drugs which are manufactured in India today in, by a limited number of players and where there is monopoly today under the new law. All the diabetic drugs are monopoly. All the biotech drugs are un sold under monopoly. Monopoly leads to high prices. There is no doubt about that. All right, Dr. Meath, we're going to try and fit in a few more questions. Please now, do. The, uh, you're really well known or what you've done, your huge achievement has been that you were the first Indian company, factory really, to have US FDA approval, correct? So what was your reaction when you read of the criticism that other Indian pharmaceutical firms have been getting recently about standards that we were said that we cut corners? For example, what happened with Ranbaxy? But this is not only an Indian problem. It's an is it an Indian problem? It is Do not an Indian problem. It is an international problem. Okay. There are many companies in Europe, in Israel, Teva, Glaxo, Novartis, J&J, &J, all have been at some time or the other been subjected to warning letters etc. It is not only an Indian problem. What happens in India, the things have blown up out of all proportion. But it is an international problem. And I think there are two issues there. One is we all make mistakes in life. So let's put the mistake part separately. But what I'm against is fraud. Fraud should be, it's, 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 it's a bad word. Mistakes, we all make mistakes in life. But it's not only Indian companies that are found faulty many companies so what I would that suggest last question what I would therefore suggest that sometimes you make mistakes because of ignorance right. we do not fully understand what the US FDA wants us they keep on changing their rules we are sometimes unaware so the dialogue between the US FDA and Indian companies should be much much more and much closer so that we understand what they want from us but that's fascinating because then you are not of that school of thought which claims that this is big pharma america that's basically trying to crack down on the indian pharma industry big pharma uh, is cracking down indirectly big pharma does crack down on genetics mm -hmm. the, you see the new tpp uh, meetings that they are holding Correct. as to how they can maintain their monopoly. The, the, the whole question is of monopoly. Big Pharma wants to retain monopoly. So the generic industry is going to be Don't get. pushed down. All right, you said everybody makes mistakes. What mistakes has Dr. Hamid made? What's your big regret? I uh, read My big regret in life is that when I came back from after studying abroad and came and settled down in India, what did I feel was India's major problem in the early 60s. I felt at that time population, population growth. growth. So, so you were ahead of your time because you tried to introduce to the Indian I government I tried to introduce to the Indian government uh, the concept that we need uh, contraception, we need protection, etc., etc. But somehow that was my biggest failure in life. And I accept that. And even today I do feel that the Indian government in whatever form should promote something of a family planning system we used to have in the 60s the big triangle if you remember you were not born then uh, that uh, f small families small families I think that yeah, uh, I'm a great believer in that and because I tell you a city like Bombay the government estimate is that by 2050 we are going to have a population not less than 40 million what Delhi will have I don't know but life is becoming unbearable today what will it be 20 years from now All right. All right.
So your life story is an amazing one, right? Your father is Muslim. Mm. He married a Jewish woman. That's right. Which I guess in those days would be it wouldn't raise as many eyebrows as it would today. To You've grown up in this cosmopolitan culture in Bombay. All my friends friend. are Hindus. All Correct. my friends are international cosmopolitan. We so never bothered in those days. Religion didn't play a major role when I grew up. Correct. My and this new India that you see as we head into this 2014 election. We, I am not much of a politician because I, I do believe. Again, I like people to promote what they are best at. And for me, health care is a big issue. And I would again reiterate that you need a healthy India for whatever we are talking about. For NDTV to go ahead in the next 25 years, you need a healthy India. And that is my, our job, to see that India is healthy. And we hope that the government takes us in indigenous drug companies in confidence, which unfortunately they haven't. You're talking to me, mm -hmm. but you mean to say in the last 50 years any government official has talk, spoken to us? That look, with your experience, can you advise us what to do, what not to do? No. I think it is time that the Indian government took the indigenous manufacturers in confidence. Right. and said, look, gentlemen, try and put our house in order. You are one of us. And I would repeat that. Like I told you earlier, I'm willing to give whatever technology we have developed in the last 75 years. Wow free to the Indian government if they want to produce their own drugs for, for the country. So an open offer for the Indian government to come pick your brains. Anytime. You know, we're a company at 25, you're a company at over 60 years, so what advice would you give someone, a company like NDTV at 25? NDTV at 25, I think what you're doing now is very commendable, that you want to promote what India ought to be and how to get there. I think like your title of your theme today is solutions. Correct. What are the solutions uh, that we are looking forward to? How do you solve the problems? Now in healthcare, one of the major, major problem is monopoly. And if we are, like I mentioned the word earlier to you, um, uh, dharma. Correct. What is our responsibility and what is our belief? My thing is in healthcare, none should be denied treatment and access to medicines at affordable prices is a human right. You cannot get away from that. And we must all work towards that. And uh, I would also like to add that India's destiny should be in our hands. I don't want to hear from people, oh, but we can't upset the international community. Hell, you've got 1.6 billion coming up very soon. You owe something to this generation, to the next generation, particularly in the area of healthcare. You want a healthy India. Today, when I read that 500 Indians, 500 million Indians live their lives without electricity, 800 million Indians have no sanitation facilities. I mean, it hurts one. And I think if NDTV promotes more programs on their channel on the subject of solutions and educates the public as to what they should or should not do, it will go a great step forward. government had not in the 1970s said that they're going to stop recognizing these patents the Indian pharmaceutical industry would not be able to grow to the size that it is exactly. today so are you one of the few industries in India that can actually say they benefited from the economic policies of the Indira Gandhi government then which include in in many this is protectionism it was protectionism because you must understand what is protectionism particularly in healthcare mm -hmm. when you have patents Patents are between equals. A country with a technological base like America 
and Germany. It's equal. Today in the world, uh, in health, in drugs, 99% of the new drugs that come out, come out from the West, Correct. not from the East. So it's, it's a not a level playing field. When my technology is on par with the rest of the world, then yes. But we've been 300 years uh, slaves virtually. Now we've just woken up in the last, since 1947. Give us some time to catch up on technology. We can't remain third world and fourth world indefinitely. But till you are on technological parity with the rest of the developed world, you cannot ha have monopoly. That's my uh, story or whatever you like to know. And also in healthcare, in pharmaceuticals, it's very important as to who actually makes the raw materials. So that's also a very important factor. True. Um, lastly, if I can just uh, go back to your education, you you mentioned about how important education was yes. for you. Just you when you studied at Cambridge, what was it like to be an Indian there then? Because just recently, Ratan Tata talked about how intimidating it was to study at in uh, Harvard. Harvard, HBS. It was intimidating, but I still believe that. But I did science, I did chemistry, and I stayed on and did a PhD in Cambridge. So I was there for six years. You worked so with Alexander Todd. That's right. He was a Nobel Prize winner. Correct. Uh, in 1957, and I worked with him in 57 to 1960. It was quite a, a quite an experience, and I felt when I came back to India that I owed it to India. And one of the things that I'm doing today, promoting science in India, not by sending youngsters abroad to study. I'm trying to promote science in India by teaching teachers. I'm setting up an institute in India with the Royal Society of Chemistry in England okay. to teach teachers chemistry so that they can then go all over India and teach chemistry. So now my philanthropical thing and for my company as well, how do I teach teachers? All right. And what we did in HIV AIDS 15, uh, 10, 12 years ago, we are now planning to do the same thing in cancer. Cancer and diabetes. And diabetes. But again, my hands are tied because of monopoly. So this is something I beg the Indian government to relook at the Indian patent laws. What are the uh, lacunas? What flexibilities there are? How we can have a system of in licensing? <coughs> And they can bring in compulsory licensing so that there is no monopoly. Mono patents lead to monopoly. And we cannot afford a monopoly. Dr. Hamid, it is such an honor to meet you. One of India's 25 greatest living Thank Indians you. and still going strong. Thank still you so much.